We've got an amazing speaker, extremely lively, Shakir Mohammed, uh, who's a research scientist at DeepMind. He joined uh, in 2013. Um, before that, he was at CIFAR in Canada as a PhD um, from the University of Cambridge at Zubin. And he's also leading an incredible initiative across Africa called the Deep Learning in Daba, which I hope he'll also talk about. So with that, Shakir, over to you. It's really a pleasure to be here this morning. And if you were to ask me to describe my research um, off this stage or during a break, I would probably describe it as a search for the principles of reasoning and intelligence. And so I thought I would use that today as the topic to discuss with you all my, the way I think about machine learning, its principles, and what, how we build machine learning systems, sort of pathways that we have available to take us to go from principles to products, and then sort of tie that together with um, thinking around generative models, one of the areas that I spend most of my research time doing. And so uh, my name is Shakir. I am South African. I'm born and bred in Johannesburg, which is the image you see on the screen. And I, as was mentioned, I took my path to machine learning from Johannesburg to Cambridge, um, across the world to Canada, and then eventually back to London, where I'm now a research scientist at DeepMind, and I've been there for more than five years now. And I think about my own work, and I structure my research in two different ways, or under two different pillars. The first is the pillar that I want to talk to you about today, which are these principles of reasoning and intelligence, and what it means to build those general purpose learning algorithms that we think we want to deploy for the benefit of humanity and society. Of equal importance, though, is the second pillar, which I call transformation. And by transformation, I mean the work that each of us needs to do and the steps we need to take to build more equal and fair societies. And so I wanted to just take one minute to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing in this area of transformation. Um, about a year and a half ago, we created a new grassroots organization called the Deep Learning in Daba. And the mission of the Deep Learning in Daba was to strengthen African machine learning. And the vision that we had and what we wanted to do was to create a pan-African movement and more generally a global movement where we shift the conversation, where we as Africans are no longer just considered receivers of those advances in AI and machine learning, the advances that have brought us all together in this room today, but to shift that to become rather owners and active shapers of those advances in machine learning. And we're doing a lot of work in this, in this space. I consider it to be some of the most impactful work that I'm currently doing. And I'd love to talk to any of you about it. So if you want to know more about the way we strengthen machine learning in Africa and our work in creating leadership in AI, please uh, speak to me um, afterwards. Um, but let's shift our focus back to machine learning. And I have various ways of thinking about machine learning, but this is one of the ways um, of thinking about it where I think of a hierarchy of building from principles to products. And this hierarchy sort of begins with those foundations that we are all trained on. They are the foundations of probability theory, of Bayesian analysis, of optimization. These are those core tools that we use and that we always have in the back of our mind and that we're going to hear embedded throughout today. And on those foundations, we can then build those questions of information. How is it that given the data we have seen, we can represent elements of its uncertainty? That can we make certain causal statements given the type of data that we have? How do we make predictions? Can I say that I'm actually learning something given the new data that I've acquired? And once we have these two, we can then begin to ask those questions which are often uh, asked in the, in the path towards AGI. How do we do long-term planning? Can I build models of a world that allow me to simulate the environment and understand the long-term impact of my actions? Can I do rapid learning from limited amounts of data? Or even when I'm seeing very large amounts of data, how do I do rapid learning? How can I explain what it is that I have seen and use that to then uh, drive the way I will learn? And ultimately, then, we get those products and applications that we are all seeking to build. How do we build the next generation of assistive technologies? How do we advance our understanding of science in the realm where data is so large that we no longer have the tools, basic tools, to understand them? How do we track, under, uh, tackle those seemingly intractable problems of climate and of healthcare? And how do we build autonomous systems that are both safe and fair? And each of us will be navigating this hierarchy in our own way. 
we will start at many different places. We will take many different elements of that hierarchy in the work that we do. And I want to just tell you about one pathway through this hierarchy, and that is the pathway related to generative models. Generative models is one of the areas that I spend most of my time doing work in, and I think it's a great testbed to think through all of these, uh, this hierarchy, this stack, basically, of principles to products and how we actually build that. So what is a generative model? A generative model can be various things, but in its simplest form is a model that allows us to learn a simulator of data. Often, for example, in climate science, we usually use very expensive, long-running numerical weather predictions. Can we learn instead a simulator of those numerical weather data that will allow us to do faster simulations and answer alternative kinds of um, simulation questions? A different version of that uh, definition, based on its statistical foundations, is to build a model for density estimation. So all the data that we see around us has a probabilistic, a statistical structure. And this question of generative models asks, can we learn that statistical structure and then use that structure to then explain um, the way the world uh, acts around us? Or finally, can we use unsupervised learning? When we don't have data or labels, how do we learn from these unlabeled data sets? So in contrast to reinforcement learning or supervised learning, where we have some form of supervision be it weak. And these um, three definitions are very compatible with each other. And they have certain other characteristics which come through. These generative models are usually probabilistic. If we want to be simulating alternative variations of reality, then we need to be able to tame and manage randomness and uncertainty in various ways. These models will be different from classifiers in that they will operate in very high dimensional data spaces. Think entire images, entire videos, long sequences of text, rather than just single categories. And the key thing, when you do not have any other kind of label or other kind of supervision, all you have to train yourself is the data and its distribution and its statistical structure. And so often we will always look to exploit and learn that statistical structure. There are several types of generative models that we have. The simplest one and the first one, the most oldest type of generative model, are these fully observed generative models. In this particular image, these are the autoregressive models. And what makes them fully observed is that they describe the world based only on things that they have seen. So in this particular image, if, that were, if the x's are pixels in an image, we'll say pixel 3 is dependent only on the pixels that have appeared before it. And this is a very powerful way of um, building a model. Um, a second way of building a generative model is what we call latent variable models. These latent variable models do something different. They introduce this unobserved, hidden latent variable. And with this hidden latent variable, we can now describe instead a causal description of how we think the data in the world was generated. And so both of these two models can also fall into the category of what we would call deep generative models. These deep generative models, every arrow that you see in these diagrams, are themselves represented by deep neural networks. They can be any types of deep neural networks, convolutional networks, um, recurrent networks, or any other variations, so that we can actually use the power of deep learning and scalability to large data sets. Of course, there are other kinds of generative models other than these. For many other kinds of problems, we won't actually have this directed understanding of how data will exist. We may just have an understanding of their dependency structure. And so we have the undirected graphs. And there are other kinds of frameworks altogether which have been effective in other applications, for example, the sum product networks. So generative models have many, many interesting applications, and I'll come back to those applications a bit afterwards. But one reason to be interested in these generative models is because they offer you a test bed with which to discover all the principles of machine learning that we'd want to do. And this is one of the reasons why I spend so much time thinking about these generative models. So for us to understand a little bit more about the kind of principles that we would like to develop, it's useful to instead think of machine learning in a different way. And this view of machine learning will posit that there are four statistical operations that we need to consider. And all of machine learning can be described using these four statistical operations. The basic statistical operation will be called data enumeration. How is it that we collect the data that we have? 
Do we have it just from logs or from observation? Are we running a controlled experiment, a set of trials? And that process itself is a very important, meaningful, and the first step that we, that we deal with machine learning and that we need to understand. And this is sort of where our work with our domain experts and other kind of areas fits in. Once we have the data, then we need to start thinking of two different ways of dealing with our data. The first way is called summarization. This is the process of taking all your data together, finding its structural properties. What is it that makes this data common, and how can we exploit that underlying structure? Typically, we will call this modeling. There's the opposite process of summarization. This is called comparison. How can we take our data apart? How can we tear it apart? How can we look how every data point is different from all other data points? And typically, this process, we will look at the realm of experimental design and how we actually design those experiments. And you can do a back and forth between summarization and comparison. But once we have data and we have the models and the questions we want to do, there is a central component that is needed, and that is called inference. Inference is the task of how we connect the data that we have to the models that we have designed. And inference will be the central question of machine learning. When we think of doing inference in this process of summarization and modeling, we will usually call on the principles of estimation and learning. And when we deal with inference related to comparisons, we typically call that hypothesis testing. So as you know, part of the work that I do is thinking about the pathway to building general purpose learning systems. And the first message would be to say that as we reach artificial general intelligence, this AGI will be the most refined instantiation of these four statistical properties. And if you agree with me about the centrality of inference in this process of thinking, then we will see that the core questions of AGI will be those core questions of statistical inference. And that's why it's important for us to continue to think along, along these lines. So there are several familiar algorithms um, that you may have heard of. The first, for example, is the popular, the voice of Google Assistant, which is called WaveNet. WaveNet is in this category of fully observed autoregressive models. And what makes it good, it, again, it just uses every x is dependent on all the x's that come before. And the principle of inference is very simple. It operates in this area of summarization and of estimation and learning. And because this model just operates in this fully observed regime, we can write out the probability of these kind of data in these models very directly. We don't need to do anything else. And because we have access to this knowledge, this P of x, that central statistical structure of the data, we can then use that to actually do all the learning at very large scale. This other category that I mentioned are the latent variable models, and many of you may have encountered the variational autoencoder. The variational autoencoder takes a hidden noise variable, which I call Z, and puts it through a model to generate data. And the principle of inference in these variational autoencoders is to learn a reversal of that generative process. Can we learn instead the reverse process from data back to that hidden source? And if we can learn that reverse process, then we can actually do the process of learning. The cost of actually introducing these hidden, unobserved variables in this data is that we no longer have access to this probabilistic quantity that we call P of x. So what we have to instead do is introduce an approximation. And we introduce a very specific type of approximation, which is a bound on that probability. And that bound then gives us the right kind of statistical guarantees to show that we can learn the correct kind of data. Many of you would have heard of uh, another kind of uh, latent variable model, which are the generative adversarial networks. These operate now in that regime of comparison. They have this latent variable z, which goes through a generative model. And then the question of inference is, can I compare the, the data that I generated to the data that I saw in the real world? And in this case, the statistical question of comparison is not to directly try to compute P of x or to use an approximation to it, but to study this object P of x indirectly using this kind of probability ratio. And so we can see just through these three models alone, we were able to span the space of different kinds of comparison, summarization, and inference. And we have made great progress over the last few years. When I first started working in this area of generative models, these were the types of images that we could generate. They were extremely blurry. And over time, we continued to develop them, advance our understanding. And now we can routinely and quite easily generate images um, that are 
high quality of the form are even better than the ones on the side and have higher dimension. And we've continued to advance our understanding of those principles of optimization by studying the kinds of gradients we need to have, the kinds of integrals that are underlying them. We have now extended to move beyond just thinking of images, but to think of text and audio. We can also move on to more structured types of data, graphs and relations. We can also think about how is it we can confuse these methods together. How can we fuse variational autoencoders with GANs to build something that may actually be better? And can we then extend all these principles, the kind of learnings that we've received from generative models, to influence other types of machine learning. Particularly, we are now beginning to think um, of the work of generative models and generative thinking in reinforcement learning, and those impacts in supervised learning using Bayesian neural networks, for example. And so these generative models have widespread applicability, and I usually think of them in three categories. There are the applications of generative models for products, for those for science, and those for AI. And I'll just take you through a brief um, uh, tour through a small set of them. So I think we can already see a new generation of compression and communication coming up, where we have perhaps low bandwidth channels, and we do now need to support users or kind of products or different kinds of applications over those products, where we either want to do super resolution to take a low resolution image and make them much better at higher resolution, or to replace existing um, compression algorithms with newer kinds of compression that have some form of contextual understanding of the data that they're operating on, like the images or those hierarchy. And I think there's much more to come in this, in this space. Of course, there's already we see this new regime of assistive technologies, whether we are trying to build a new generation of hearing aids where we use generative models to try and disentangle the different kinds of signals that we may hear in the auditory scene and then combine them together. And if we have anything which is missing in that auditory signal, to then recomplete re it so that the user actually has the best uh, experience. And as I mentioned, the example of WaveNet, which is now the voice of Google Assistant is how can we use those generative models to give us all better new text-to-speech technologies um, that give us better voices, that understand our different voices in different ways, and that can help us address different kinds of languages. So again, much, much more to come. I think also we're beginning to see this new era of generative design, and that could mean many different things. In the simplest setting, we are thinking about building these um, human-centered products and design tools where you'll have embedded within them a generative model that can give you a way of building a design. Humans can then look at those designs and feedback and make differences. And for example, here in this uh, particular example, which was called a grammar VAE, we can now build generative models over molecular structures. And so now we are seeing a new way of doing synthetic biology and drug design where we can very quickly generate new synthetic uh, problems and molecules. We can very quickly synthesize them almost in a day in a lab. We can assay them very quickly and then complete that synthetic biology loop. And again, as we com continue to build these models, we'll see those kinds of applications. Science, as I mentioned, is now faced with a deluge of data, so much data that we now need to ha have those basic fundamental tools can no longer apply. So for example, if we're looking at the kind of particle accelerators at the Large Hadron Collider in this first image in the top left, there we can use deep learning and those principles of comparison to try and build a detector of what are interesting particles to actually look at in those detectors. And the problem of novelty detection is one of the biggest problems facing um, particle physics these days. Or even when we are taking images from our large telescope, how is it that we can use generative models to understand the structure of the cosmos? And then I think, of course, one dear to many people's hearts is sort of the applications in healthcare. We are already seeing new ideas of using generative models within imaging technology, where we can use generative models to generate multiple different variations of segmentations to help explain to our users, to our doctors, how is it that these segmentations, what are the kind of variabilities of those segmentations um, that are possible and available and how to make decisions. And then of course we are all thinking probably of how is it that we can use these generative models to simulate patient pathways, to simulate their health outcomes, to understand what the impact of certain treatments and interventions might be. And generative models will soon have a place um, in, this, in this realm. Of course, there are many challenges which remain. Evaluation continues to be one of our major and largest challenges. 
This is one that we share with many other areas of machine learning. How is it that we can, in all of these application domains that I mentioned, where we won't have large data, we will only be able to interact with users in a very limited domain, how can we learn from limited amounts of data? And then, of course, as we think about building general purpose learning systems, that pathway to AGI, how is it that we will then be able to integrate these generative models within to larger systems that have both decision-making systems based on reinforcement learning, as well as vision and detection recognition systems from other kinds of methods? Um, so there are, of course, many obstacles and opportunities. I think our work of generative models is just beginning. There is a lot more to do, and I think we will just find, continue to find many more interesting applications. And of course, with those applications will come new questions, new obstacles, and new opportunities. Um, so my path and my search for the principles of reasoning intelligence continues. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I have any questions. Yeah. No takers. Hey, Jonathan, thank you for fidelity. Um, you, you touched on AGIs in many, in many points. I'm trying to understand how far along are we on the path to that? We know deep learning is not AGI, not near AGI. Is it something we see in your lifetime? Is it something we see in the next decade? How do you feel about it? <laughs> it's an impossible question, but you know, how much advancement have we really made on that path in the last five years? Um, I think you know, if you can ask everyone in the room to create for themselves a roadmap towards AGI. And I think that's a good question to start. And maybe I sort of presented sort of a bit of that, what could a roadmap would look like. And so then once you unpack the roadmap, then you can sort of tease apart all the interesting kind of questions that would be. Those questions that I called that reasoning layer. How can we do planning? How can we build models of the environment and the worlds around us? How can we offer explanations? And I think on several of those dimensions, we have made a great deal of progress. And others, we have not made so much progress. So I don't want to give a number to that, but I do believe genuinely that we have made significant progress on answering many of those uh, different fronts. And now, for us, the question is to look at which are the ones that we have not been able to do so well. Maybe perhaps questions of causality at scale and other questions around explanation, for example. And then once we use those two, um, how then do we go and build that difficult problem of building integrated systems? So I think because of that, that's a very difficult challenge to do. There's a question at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Arthur, UCL. Um, you were mentioning uh, generative models of uh, chemical space. Uh, I was wondering, actually, because you know, obviously, you can you can explore and and create different model, uh, different molecules, but different molecules will be uh, not equally easy to synthesize. Purity would be a, of a concern. Mm -hmm. Chemical space is inherently difficult, and there is an entire science to consider. How do you how do you take the real world and and merge it into the actual generative model in this case? Yeah, the, that, that's a really great point. And I think um, this is sort of, again, why it's so important for us to work with those domain experts and you know, bring that knowledge into machine learning. It's not about just building machines that are going to replace all the knowledge that we have. We actually do want to build. And these days, I think one of the very interesting forefront regimes is sort of how do we build deep learning, for example, or machine learning that uses that kind of expert knowledge. So for example, we have many kind of differential equations and SDEs that define the evolution of those chemical structures. How do we build deep learning that embeds those kind of ODEs and SDEs within the model? And I think they're actually several interesting papers and some that I'm thinking of myself that really will you know, avoid the problem that you're seeing. You could see it already in the images. Most of those chemical structures don't make sense. You could not synthesize and assay those. And so this is sort of an interesting research boundary, and I think you know, one of the most interesting and exciting areas of really seeing an application for building that kind of expert-centered new approach to synthesis and design. There's a question here. As we build generative models or models that are capable of building models of the world or generative models, how important is efficiency in terms of the data that we need to build them? And can you give us an insight into sort of the current frontiers of efficient learning of these models? Um, so I think the question of data efficiency, of course, is the top of mind for many machine learners. And I think we'll have 
uh, a different meaning in different contexts. So if we are in a regime where we can collect lots of data, and the, this typical regime is a simulator, we already have a simulator, then I think there's a different question. But if we are, for example, running a trial, then of course the question becomes very important. So I think the problem of data efficiency is as important now and continuing to be more important than it ever was before. So there are several pathways that we're thinking about what data efficiency means in this space of machine learning. One, as the question was mentioned at the back, you don't need to learn everything about the world around you from scratch. We already have a great deal of knowledge. How is it that we can combine those knowledges that we have already into our models, which means you already you know, leapfrog ahead to go to the future. There are sort of two other ways um, that I can think about where people think about the role of data efficiency. One are called systems of memory. And so the system of memory will technically be, take us into a regime of what we call semi-parametric modeling, where we combine parametric models like deep networks with other kinds of non-parametric models like a nearest neighbor, for example. And a very fast way to learn, and the way many of us believe that humans learn is that when you see something new, just remember the last thing you did and repeat that when you see it again until you can collect data. So this kind of fusion of different techniques is sort of one other approach. I forget the third one that I was going to say, but um, that's, that's that. I don't know. Are there any other questions at the back? Is there a mic? Hi. Uh, my name is Ollie. I'm from uh, King's College. Um, I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts on the, what makes a successful relationship between domain experts and uh, artificial intelligence experts of various kinds. Mm, that's an interesting one. Um, I think this is probably one of the most fraught questions of you know, applied science. And, and I think I can even say from my own experience that not starting to work with your domain experts early in the phase of your project is something that actually holds you back. It can set you back six months, actually, a year sometimes even, by not beginning that conversation um, early on. And the reason is because we will come together, we'll have very different languages, and I think the main barrier is just for us to agree on a language. What does it mean? When I write probability P of X, I have something very particular in mind because of the way I was trained and the way I think and the kind of hierarchies of thought that I'm using, and other people will have a very different kind of thing. So we've just found that it's important to sort of do very early on in those conversations, just by beginning meeting once a month to read a set of papers. Every week, the different groups will suggest one paper from their side, one paper from your side. And over time, you sort of build this language. Oh, that's what a budget equation means. Oh, when you see this symbol in this SDE, that's what that means. And so then over time, you can then form that joint knowledge and then go forward with the project. And that's, that's sort of at least how I think about it.